All righty, last lecture here with this um, power topic before we get into our final topic of the class, which will be um, broadly groups. But anyways, here we'll be just scratching the surface uh, of some aggression and violence material. Obviously, this is something where, you know, to get a more in-depth, detailed understanding of this and why this occurs, I would require, require many classes in itself, um, sociology, cognitive psychology, social, social psychology, political science, um, religion, all that's necessary for understanding aggression and violence. But we'll get into just a couple of um, theories or ideas for um, both interpersonal and intergroup violence, as well as potentially um, some potential reasons for why um, violence has reduced, um, most of that being based on Pinker material, which is your reading for this topic. Um, but anyways, with homicide and violence, um, getting into just some theory on how power, um, this power topic applies to aggression and violence, specifically homicide here. There are two basic perspectives on why there's homicide and these perspectives are needed. Um, because homicide from just a general evolutionary perspective doesn't really make sense, right? To um, be killing off uh, other individuals of the same species. And the first theory with this though is called adaptation theory, which argues that actually sometimes um, homicide is adaptive and functional. And so actually, these two examples we talked about already um, at the beginning of this class with the evolutionary psych theory. Um, we have infanticide. And so we talked about how potentially if you think the child isn't gonna live long or if you don't have enough resources for all of your children um, at that point, based on this theory and just this um, infanticide would make sense. Additionally, we talked about jealousy um, in terms of specifically males competing um, for other mates. And so here, based on adaptation theory um, and this jealousy idea, it may make sense for homicide to occur in order to ensure the um, paternity and to ensure that um, fitness idea of keeping one's genes alive and all that. The second theory is byproduct theory. This theory describes that violence is adaptive, but homicide is not, and homicide is actually a mistake um, that sometimes just occurs with violence. And so based on this theory, we use aggression um, and violence as a tactic or a strategy for protecting our own status or mates. And homicide is when the strategy goes overboard. And so for the strategy to work correctly, um, based on byproduct theory, homicide shouldn't happen, but it sometimes does more as a mistake. Um, so overall, adaptation theory, um, theorizing that homicide is adaptive, byproduct theory, um, violence is adaptive, homicide is a mistake. And these are just two possible explanations or theories. Um, I wouldn't say that there's overwhelming evidence for one over the other. Interestingly, it might be, I mean, it might not always feel like this, certainly, but there does seem to be, and this is from the Pinker book. Um, again, a lot of this material is from Pinker Ideals, um, chapters, book, and there had, does seem to have been a reduction in the homicide over time. And additionally, this seems to depend on the type of, I guess, civilization that's going on and how that's organized. Um, so no matter the theory or the explanation, throughout history, there is, throughout human history, there's a lot of, um, a lot of homicide, a lot of murder. But yeah, it doesn't seem to have been lower than right now. And one explanation for this that we'll get into a little bit more um, in a bit is 
the evolution of states. Um, and so states with laws and states holding some power um, within themselves set up kind of how we know and see today. That's um, what we're talking about here with the states. The percentage of deaths based on things like warfare seems to be quite a bit lower. And this isn't just now, this is um, over a long period of history as well. However, um, in other cultural um, setups, such as with hunter gatherers, um, where there's not so much specified um, state areas, there seems to be higher percentages of death by violence and warfare. And we see this um, even just with our neighboring state over there in South Dakota um, and some prehistoric archeological sites. Um, it seems as though based on evidence from a lot of these um, digs and things like that, that a large percentage of um, evidence being found points towards their um, being even as high as 60% of deaths based on things like violence and warfare, which again, now um, with the set of states seems to be quite a bit lower. Another um, aspect that seems to play a role in interpersonal violence is having this culture of honor. And this is just one form of evidence that environment seems to influence violence. Um, and so in this case, kind of lack of state or um, Leviathan, which we'll talk about more. Um, and so this gets into having one's own resources and feeling the need to protect the resources of itself. And so this just vary based on env environment and location. Um, some popular locations where this type of culture of honor is popular would be frontier areas. So like Wyoming back in the day, um, the American South and West, Latin America, and just more general um, herding cultures. And so with this culture of honor, it involves um, defending one's identity and defending one's property and the notion that defending that with violence is okay. Um, and, you know, you think about just again, Wyoming for an example, back in the day when um, this is more of a frontier location, right? There's less of a setup for things like police and authority and people who will come and help if something goes wrong. If um, you know, you're a rancher or something back in the day and someone steals a portion of your cattle, there's no one to call, right? So that's when this um, defending one's identity and property and the self um, with, violent, with violence makes sense. And so with this culture of honor, we do typically see um, increases in violence. Uh, part of this is um, machismo. And so just broad threat to masculinity. Um, again, this can look like jealousy that we've talked about before. This can look like, um, you know, probably a large portion of bar fights or, um, yeah, fights between two people start like this with um, and even extends things like insults and bad looks um, because that can be a sign that, oh, I'm not getting this respect for myself or my identity or my property. And so this person might come over and, um, you know, mess with me or my stuff. So I need to assert my status here. And there's also this norm of just self-reliance um, that, again, gets at the idea that, uh, no one's coming to help if something happens that you have to protect your resources yourself. Um, and yeah, so overall, this has just been um, associated with things like, uh, things like violence and aggression. And so Pinker has some explanations for violence, both, both interpersonal and intergroup. So first going over the interpersonal Again, it does seem like there has been a reduction in homicide um, with the formation of states. And the question is, why is that? Um, Pinker has a couple of explanations for this. One would be a positive sum interaction. So this includes things like trade where both 
parties win by keeping the peace here. And so actually we can have more power, more resources, more status if we cooperate with each other. Additionally, um, there can be restrictions on killing with the formation of states. And so this Leviathan, Leviathan stemming from um, Hobbes theory, philosophy, that um, the, when the nation state has more power than the individual, um, that is what this Leviathan one is getting at. And so with this power, there is more enforcement um, and restrictions against killing that can be imposed within the group. And so that's one possible explanation for why the formation of these states can decrease violence and aggression that we see within the states. However, there certainly might still be wars um, and this might not be a reason for a decrease in things like war and geno genocide between groups. Um, this is still, again, at the interpersonal level. We, we can also talk and look talk about and look at violence and aggression from this more inner group perspective. And so what we see like, time and time again um, with inner group violence um, and aggression and assertions of power and all of that is that there is a tendency to dehumanize the outgroup in these times of war and genocide. And so um, this involves taking away things like equal rights and ideas of moral worth of this outgroup. And in the next topic, we'll get in more into um, how groups are created and groups and outgroups, um, stereotyping, biases, and group bias, things like that, but um, specific to violence. And so, I mean, a common example when we think about war and dehumanizing um, the enemy or outgroups, World War II propaganda, right? And so a lot of this propaganda consisted of trying to show that the enemy was a monster, in other words, not human. Um, and so a lot of that had to do with things like, oh, these other people will come and if they win, they'll come, they'll rape the women, they will um, take the children away. Um, and so you can see here this idea of someone coming in with a bomb, the enemy, which is more skeleton and monster-like than human. Additionally, right, the hands here, keep these hands off. Um, monster-like hands, those just don't really look human, right? So again, dehumanization of the enemy, um, and it's not, I don't think it's very hard to kind of correlate and think about how this dehumanization piece can lead to um, and be a part of some pretty gross just ideologies and um, viewpoints of outgroups. Additionally, in times of war, it seems as though um, people tend to classify and talk about outgroups in more simple terms using things like stereotypes and of uh, or like this. Um, and so, yeah, tension and conflict relate to simplistic stereotyped views of the outgroup. Um, and this is an example of another form of dehumanization. Uh, and this just shows that this is for the um, Israeli Palestinian conflict. This shows the times of war, the um, use of complexity when talking about these various groups uh, tends to decrease. And so Pinker has, like with interpersonal violence, some ideas about what may have caused reductions over time for intergroup violence. I know certainly sometimes it doesn't seem like there's much of a reduction. There's still quite a bit going on um, all over the world. The Israeli-Palestine conflict still going on. Um, Russia. Um, lots of different examples, but still it does seem as though based on looking at percentage of deaths that occurs due to warfare, it does seem like that um, percentage has decreased with evidence points to a decrease over time. And so why is that? Um, especially over the last couple hundred years. And so general reductions in war and genocide or general reductions again in intergroup violence. Pinker will talk about this in terms of 
one possible reason for this decrease, um, kind of sticking with this Leviathan and Nate's idea is that of liberal democracy. And so I'm not talking about, and Pinkers, Pinkers and talking about, you know, like American liberals and conservative, We're talking about liberal democracy in terms of basic human rights um, and improvements of morals in that regard, um, as well as political stability. So increasing the viewpoint that all individuals are equally valuable from a moral sense can certainly help with decreasing things like dehumanization, right? That is associated with these intergroup uh, wars and genocides. And political stability and everyone, again, uh, moving more towards equal rights, everyone taking part in things like politics. And now we're getting more towards, if you call the power stuff that we talked about, right? Now we're getting more towards joint gain um, and noticing that all sides can gain more status and resources and power with um, this uh, peace and trades and all that. Um, which shows again the importance of the power stuff we talked about in terms of joint gain versus, um, you know, if that switches to own gain, now it's, okay, we want, um, we have the resources that we have, but we want more. Um, we want more resource, resources, we want more status. Um, so we're gonna go take yours. Um, and obviously things like that can also lead to dehumanization um, and wars and genocide and, Similar idea with the um, relative gain, right? Like the idea of I want more resources um, than what you have. So we are going to fight and have war about that. So anyways, long story short, um, or not really short sure at this point, but um, yeah, Pinker's idea is that this liberal democracy um, plays a role in decreasing intergroup violence. And again, um, just having these states with general laws of based on um, equal rights and morality for the value of all humans. Um, so can't just go around killing people as that would obviously be a major, um, you know, both democracy and human rights violation. Um, additionally, a couple more possible um, things that play a role with this decrease. Uh, Reduced ideology and nationalism, so kind of a move towards this is what I think, this is what I believe, but maybe it's not worth dying for this cause. Um, so things like less extreme political movements, certainly I'm not trying to argue that these things are completely dead. Um, but uh, recently, you know, less things like communism, fascism, um, extreme polit political movements on both sides. Um, religious disputes and nationalistic disputes, right? These are both things that have caused a lot of wars in the past. So maybe we're seeing a bit of um, a decrease in both and the willingness to die for both causes in terms of religion as well as one's nation, um, therefore decreasing intergroup violence based on both religion um, and things like countries. Uh, Leviathan too. So this is getting at post World War II um, things for the most part. So more treaties and international laws between societies, right? Creating one more of one big collection as opposed to a ton of different various in groups and out groups, and trying to use things like the United Nations and NATO to. Um, create systems that benefit everybody. Again, getting at this joint gain as opposed to fighting each other for resources. Um, and so, yeah, these are a few main reasons based on um, Pinker's writing that uh, could be causes for decrease and decreases in aggression and violence overall, thinking more about joint gain, right? But a caveat is that although we have been moving this direction, um, it's certainly no guarantee that it will stay that way. And there certainly feels like we're on a brink of uh, more and more violence sometimes. And there's certainly some things that stand out in terms of threat for things like um, democracy and 
these more collective groups with peaceful trades and peaceful, um, more peaceful disagreements as opposed to wars, right? Um, and one of those that really stands out is increased white ethnic nationalism, which reports show that this might be increasing in areas like Russia, Europe, and the US. Um, and so there are tr very troubling commonalities in white nationalist groups. Certainly there are different ones. Um, they're not all the same, but they do have commonalities um, that are threatening to the society we, as we see it today with this liberal democracy. Um, and so some of these are not having a huge liking for things like international organizations, trade and migration, which obviously we talked about how that could be an explanation for um, a decrease in violence is having more of these things, increases in racism, anti-Semitism, um, authoritarian and anti-democratic stances. An example of that is Viktor Orban um, in Hungary promoting um, their big old speech about illiberal democracy. Um, additionally, things like suppression of free speech and press and political violence we see in these white nationalist groups and um, see increases at least. And again, you can, if you're still, if you still have tinker in your mind, you can look at these things and think about how, you know, each starts to go against, um, you know, the human, this human rights movement um, where all humans are valuable and we create these liberal democracies more based on and set up for uh, international organizations and trade and things like white nationalist groups are certainly threatening to that. Um, so yeah, that's what I have for you on violence and aggression. Again, this is just scratching the surface. Please give the Pinker um, article a read. And next we will get into more background on maybe how intergroup conflict can occur. And we'll do that with social identity theory and we'll get into just more group based um, material with the last topic.